Together with General Odierno's predecessor in Iraq, General David Petraeus, wrote the book on civilian military cooperation in a conflict arena. Their working relationships were unparalleled and their success has become the how-to guide for similar future ventures. Ambassador Ryan Crocker is also a household name for many of you here. Despite a most distinguished foreign service career spanning over 37 years, in which he never failed to follow his own mantra of making the hard choices and going to the hard places, and along with his current position as Dean and Executive Professor of the George Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M University, Ambassador Crocker has always found time to visit councils around the country, addressing many of you here today. So not only do we appreciate your outstanding service to our country, we are also very grateful to your service to our organization. Thank you. General Odierno is also no stranger to making hard choices and going to hard places, having recently returned from serving as commanding general of multinational forces in Iraq and taking on the relatively calmer position, we hope, as commander of joint forces in Hampton Roads, Virginia. We hope that you too will soon become part of the World Affairs Council family, beginning of course with your home council in Hampton Roads, Virginia. <laughs> And you can take that as either an invitation or a warning. <laughs> so please join me now in giving our illustrious panel a very warm welcome. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate it. Is this, is this on? Am I right? Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted also to uh, join Maria in thanking both Ryan and General Odierno for their service. Uh, to the United States of America. Uh, to be here, to sit here with them is a, is, a, is a great honor for me. You'll notice also that the retired State Department has now got the Pentagon surrounded here. Um, and uh, we'll try to go from there. Um, General Odierno has a meeting with the Secretary of Defense um, a little bit later this afternoon. And so we've got a hard stop about 1.15. And so the three of us thought that we would sort of dispense with opening statements um, and move to just some questions and then we want to leave plenty of time for all of you uh, to have the benefit uh, of, of, of asking questions of them. And so I thought that with your permission uh, I'd be interested in kind of following the ideas that Maria had put out and talking a little bit about the future of Iraq. I think it's also important at this stage to consider how the future of Iraq connects to uh, the larger questions of strategy that we were talking about this morning about the fight against extremism and terrorism and there's a very important subset here, Pakistan, and since we've heard about it so much, the fact that we have a former ambassador to Pakistan here is an important thing. We ought to talk a little bit about that. And then third, uh, as Maria said, for me, um, one of the most interesting things about having these two people sit here um, is that they were, as she said, the vanguard of how civilians and military people work together uh, what, in what they did uh, and also in the future. Uh, and then I'd like to take a, a little bit of time to uh, see what lessons um, they take from this question of, of the United States and Iraq and the work that they did together. And so as I say, then we'll uh, move as quickly as we can to your questions since I think that's a very uh, important part of this event. So I wanted to stick then with the issue that's in your book, the future of U.S.-Iraq relations. And I think that's fundamentally a question of the future of Iraq. And so I wondered, uh, General, if I could start with you to sort of take on this question. And here we all are. We've invested this time and energy and effort and treasure and blood. So what happens next in Iraq and what's it look like? I think I'd like to start out by saying it's important to understand how important Iraq is, uh, I believe, to the future and what a key place it is uh, in the Middle East and the role it can play, in my mind, of bringing increased security uh, uh, not only inside the Middle East but to the United States. Uh, Iraq, as everyone knows, uh, is in a very strategic location inside of the Middle East. Uh, it's a mixture of many different groups of people, Sunni, Shia, Kurds. Uh, it is, it has Iran on the right. Uh, to the east, it has many Sunni Arab states to the south and the west, and it has this large Kurdish population in the northern part of Iraq. Uh, and so, 
this represents so many peoples within, Iraq, within the Middle East, just Iraq itself becomes an extremely important place for our future. Then you put on top of that the fact that they have moved, started to move towards a democratic process. They are interested in having an open economic uh, uh, environment inside the country. And once this starts to take hold, it could be a great representation uh, for the Middle East. And in my mind, um, it could then create an atmosphere of more stability. And an example for other nations. So as we look to the future of Iraq, I would say, let me first talk from a security perspective. Um, there's still violence in Iraq today, but it's a much different violence than it was uh, just three years ago. Uh, three years ago, we had a widespread insurgency throughout the country that was spread from the north to the south, to the east to the west. Today, you basically have three groups, uh, I would say three different categories of security issues with, within Iraq. One is you still have a very small group that's involved what I would consider to be an insurgency, where they are just trying to disrupt Iraq, they want to see the government fail, and they'd like to see uh, someone else take power in Iraq. But that group now is extremely small. Secondly, you have Al-Qaeda in Iraq, who I consider is now conducting terrorist operations. They no longer can conduct broad-spectrum broad counterinsurgency operations. They are conducting terrorist attacks, although much less than they used to, but are still conducting terrorist attacks against the people of Iraq. Why are they doing that? There are many theories on this. I believe that, of course, they do not want the democratic process to fail. They do not want the state of Iraq to become stable. They'd much rather see it be fragile or failing so then they can take advantage of that in order to uh, move forward the idea of creating a base for terrorism. I believe they failed in their attempt to do this, but they won't stop. So the important piece is that we've now created, we can talk about this later, but we've now created a security force in my mind that is capable of dealing with this for the most part. And we can talk more about that later with questions. So I then, my position is, Iraq is now about political, about politics, and about economic issues. And we still have a ways to go to resolve some of the political issues involved, and we still have some ways to go to continue to improve their economic issues. And I think that's what's important as we look to the future. And I think maybe I'll leave it to Ryan to... Uh, well, first I'd uh, just like to say what a pleasure it is to be here today. Uh, pleasure to be uh, with... Uh, uh, my friend and comrade Ray Odierno, this is the first time we've been together since we were both in Iraq, and I, I just have to say you clean up real nice. That's a, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I will say that Ryan was disappointed in my dress uniform on. He doesn't actually believe I own one. So. Uh, uh, the second thing I'd like to do is move to my prepared statement. Um, uh, 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 which, which actually has to do not with me, but with you. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be at this annual gathering. I have um, worked with World Affairs Councils around the country for uh, many years and have enormous regard for the organizations. Uh, I've also worked uh, with the, um, the national organization that we represent today, uh, the World Affairs Councils of America. And uh, there are some great councils around this country, but Speaking from the policy side, um, uh, uh, as great as those parts are, the sum that the World Affairs Councils of America represents is far greater. Uh, uh, I had the opportunity in conjunction with General Odierno uh, to reach back to the national level to ask for a leadership mission to come to Iraq during the transition uh, between Bush and Obama. Uh, the number of you who participated in that mission are here today it made a difference. Uh, uh, I think there are other leadership missions that need to take place. I would like to see a leadership mission to Afghanistan. I would like to see a leadership mission to Iran. I would like to see another leadership mission to Iraq. Uh, we've turned the page. Um, I'd like to see you get out there and make an assessment before we decide we're closing the book. Um, and that, from a, from a policy perspective, 
that only really works if there is a national organization. So I, I commend you, Mark Grossman, Lori Murray, and all the people who have worked to, um, uh, to put this together today. Um, Iraq going forward, uh, uh, I, I would agree with virtually everything General Odierno said. I, I see the glass as distinctly more half full than half empty. Um, uh, he ticked through a number of, I think, very positive points. Um, let me tell you what my worry list is. Um, uh, for all of the progress that Iraq has seen over the past three years in particular, the challenges in front remain immense. Uh, uh, sectarian tension between Shia and Sunnis has subsided. Uh, ethnic tensions between Kurds and Arabs, though, have increased. Uh, uh, those tensions lie on a rickety foundation of unresolved institutional and constitutional issues, states' rights issues, the authorities of a regional government in Kurdistan versus a federal government in Baghdad versus provincial governments elsewhere. And, General Odierno and his forces have uh, uh, literally done heroic work in conjunction with both the regional government and the federal government uh, to keep the peace along the green line. Uh, but this is a holding action. The, the hard decisions still lie in front of Iraqis. Uh, General Odierno has, has painted the picture of what Iraq could be, uh, an enormous strategic asset for the region and the world. Uh, uh, Iraq, for the last half century, has really defined itself in the opposite manner, uh, an adversary, uh, a problem, an enemy. Uh, we now have the opportunity to see a different set of relationships move forward. We have an architecture for that. Uh, the agreements that uh, I negotiated during my time as ambassador, both the security agreement and, more importantly, the strategic framework agreement that defines our relationships uh, in all aspects. Uh, but there has to be content to these agreements. So in addition to all of the unresolved issues in Iraq, here's my biggest worry. Uh, that in America, as we look at uh, uh, other issues, uh, overseas like Afghanistan and Pakistan that take our attention as we look at our domestic issues, particularly our economy, um, that we are not thinking about turning the page, as President Obama said, we are thinking about closing the book in Iraq. Um, that Iraq is over, time to move on, goodbye, good luck. Um, if our thinking and if our resources as a new Congress moves into office, does go along these lines. I, I think the chances for long-term strategic success built on the great work that General Odierno and his troops and a lot of brave civilians have already put into this will diminish sharply. American interests will pay. The Iraqi people will pay anymore. May I, may I ask you both? I think both those are, are, are interesting and, and, and good answers. But they're from kind of more, uh, more or less an American perspective. But put yourself in the shoes of Iraqis at this point. And if there were two Iraqis or three Iraqis sitting here today, who some of whom had national responsibility and some of whom were, like these people here, interested citizens in the future of their country, what do you think they would say? Ryan, I'll maybe ask you that first. Well, polling is uh, an imperfect business, uh, as we all know, um, and it's particularly imperfect in um, developing societies like Iraq, but I, I was struck by two polls conducted uh, right at the uh, October 31st remissioning. Uh, a CBS poll here found that 70% of Americans were done with Iraq. Uh, time not only to remission, just time to get out. Um, been too long, cost too much, too many other things to do. Uh, a poll conducted the same week in Iraq uh, had the same percentage, 70% of Iraqis, but it was 70% of Iraqis who thought it would be a terrible mistake for them if the U.S. Uh, decided to cut sling and head home. Uh, uh, Ray, of course, has more recent experience, but what I encountered uh, talking to Iraqis in government and uh, in the markets uh, was a range of views on um, 
America, um, some tiny percentage who are really grateful for everything we have done uh, from day one, um, um, uh, a vast middle range with varying degrees of emotion who said, uh, boy, have you guys screwed this up to greater or lesser degrees, but almost all of them at the end of the day saying, now stay here until it's fixed because if you leave, it's going get to get even worse. So um, partly anecdotal, partly based on, on, um, on some surveying, um, partly based on the nearly unanimous votes in favor of the strategic framework agreement that binds us together as allies. Um, um, Iraqis, in many cases, may not like us, um, but I think in most cases feel that our role going forward is essential for their security and stability. But, but Ray's got much more recent you know, experience. I, I don't disagree at all with what Ryan said. I would just say what we have to be careful of is confusing the last thing that uh, Ryan said, liking versus needing. Um, it's very difficult to, I found over the years, and I had trouble actually myself coming to grips with this. It, it, it's hard for a country to like somebody who invaded them, who overthrew their government, and who stayed for a very long time. No matter the problem they had with Saddam Hussein and the fact that they wanted him overthrown, uh, it's still when you have foreign people within your own country and a foreign military within your own country, they're, they're, it's, it's sometimes hard to like because they want to see themselves uh, take control of their own country. But they understand that where they think they can go, the vision that they have, I, I believe the Iraqis believe that they should be, they have the potential to be a leader in the Middle East. They believe that they have the, edu they have the, the educational systems and the educated to be able to do that. I think they believe they have the natural resources to do that. But they need significant help because those resources and the infrastructure associated with it has been so ignored really since probably 1980. You can make the argument that most people don't realize Iraq's been at war since 1980. They ran Iraq war from 80 to 88, we had Desert Storm in 91, then you had sanctions, and then you had uh, the overthrow of Saddam Hussein in 2003. And one of the things I realized as I went into Iraq was we underestimated uh, the impact that sanctions had on the people of Iraq. I'm not so sure they had an effect on Saddam Hussein and the government. They had a significant impact on the people. For example, if you went around and talked, you know, doctors weren't able to update based on uh, what, what the English the, uh, medical technology and, and instructions almost given in English. They weren't able to have access to that. The oil infrastructure hadn't been updated in 20 to 30 years. The electrical infrastructure had not been updated. And in fact, I called the term, I called it societal devastation. And I think one of the things we did is we underestimated this societal devastation when we got into Iraq. And that's partly why it's taken so darn long there. Because we didn't understand what, the, what would come out of that. Part of that was an insurgency. Part of that is other people trying to take control. And the Iraqis believe that the United States, if they really wanted to, could fix this problem. And they think we've chosen not to fix it. And we've explained to them time and time again that we have done everything we can to help them to fix their problem. And so what we're trying to do now is they are now taking more control. Uh, they are now a sovereign nation based on the agreement that was negotiated back in, and signed back in uh, December of 2008. And so what we're now trying to do is build their capabilities so they can move forward. So the people of Iraq believe they need our help to do that because there is still a mistrust between elements inside of Iraq. They, don't tr they, don't, they have not built up trust between each other yet. And we kind of act as an honest broker or somebody who is there to help them to work through their issues. Not to solve their problems for them, but be there and create the environment for them to solve their own problems. And I think that's the role we have to play moving forward, in my mind. Thank you very much. I'd like to stay with Iraq for a moment, but yet turn a little bit to uh, the questions of diplomacy and civilians and military people working together. One of the things that seems to me is, is that you two pioneered uh, a way of working together. And uh, when you think about the President Obama's national security strategy and the focus on the whole of government, and you think about the uh, lessons that we learned in the Bush administration about the whole of government, and here I would say this isn't just the State Department working with the military, but it's the civilian side of government, the power of the civilian side of the United States government working with the military. 
And I'd be interested, kind of as you go, as you think forward here, for example, in the Africa Command now, military, civilian at the top, very tight uh, work together. Um, in Southcom, very much, you know, working civilians and military together. Sort of what lessons did you draw and what lessons would you give to those who are, kind of, have, have come now and say, I have this responsibility, it's a whole of government responsibility, how do I do it? Let, let, me, let me go first. I, I would just say that, uh, first off, as I go around and talk to my military audiences uh, in the leadership schools and everything else, the one thing I, I the first thing I'll tell, I'd say to everyone is, there will never be a conflict again where it's a pure military solution. I just don't see that happening anytime, anywhere. And the reason is, is because the complexity of the world we live in today and the environment we live in, whether it be the information management, the information age, whether it be uh, what people now expect because they have, they have instantaneous uh, access to information that where they know, uh, they know how to, uh, they, they, they ask for how people can help them to solve their problems, and the military can't do that by itself. So no matter where we go, we're going to have to have a civilian component that either goes in with us or very close behind us to solve the problems that we have to solve. And I think the lesson learned here is, is we just don't simply have the expertise to do that. W what we can do is we can do some things when the environment does not allow civilian agencies to operate because of the level of violence. So we can do some minor things. But our whole way of moving forward is to set up an environment where then the civilian uh, leadership can come in and take over those things where they have the expertise and they have the ability to reach out to bring the expertise in to help us to solve these problems. So one of the lessons learned that I've come out of this with, and it's even now down because of the counterinsurgency strategy, down to I would say brigade commander level or even battalion commander level is unity of effort. In the military we always talk about unity of command. You want unity of command. Well unity of command is easy. Because that means everybody works for them, you tell them what you want them to do, and supposedly they do it. <laughs> supposedly. Unity of effort is very different. Unity of effort means, we have this diagram I used to draw. In one place up in northern Iraq, you had, you had borders, so you had border police. So we had the Department of Homeland Security work, working there. Uh, we had uh, other governmental security agencies and intel agencies working there. We had the State Department working there. We had USAID working with the State Department. We had non-governmental organizations. We had the United Nations. Uh, we had uh, foreign military uh, uh, units working in there. And then I had a brigade commander who's responsible for all this, and I say, okay, I want you to build unity of effort. And, and what you have to do is you have to, have, you have to build relationships, you have to understand what they're trying to achieve and then how you can assist each other in moving forward to this broad goal you're trying to achieve. And what we used to do is we'd ignore many of these organizations. We didn't pay any attention to them. And it caused, it caused us problems, made it much more difficult than we had to. So it's about gaining unity of effort and realizing that from the four-star general level down to the lieutenant colonel level. And frankly, I found the lieutenant colonels sometimes did a hell of a lot better job than the four-star generals did in this. Because they did it for survival. What I, what I realized is we have to teach this and we have to be the examples. And we have to lay this out and show that we have a strong team and that we understand this piece of unity of effort. And that's what I think we worked with the State Department, starting with Ryan, when he was over there. And then attempting to carry that forward. And it's very important. But again, it's just not the State Department. It's all these other places. The UN plays a major role in Iraq, and we want them to play even a bigger role. So you have to at least meet, talk with them, build relationships, understand what they're trying to achieve, try to build a synergy between what you're doing and what they're doing. And so uh, that's the, probably the number one lesson learned that I learned. So. Very much. Just, just a two brief comments. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Purely military and purely diplomatic problems cease to be when the, <clears throat> the fold of gap ceased to be important. Uh, it is now one big, messy, political, military world, uh, certainly in Iraq and certainly in, in Afghanistan. Uh, so you have to have that unity of effort. And it, it starts at the top with uh, both uh, Dave Petraeus and Ray Odierno. Uh, it was, uh, you know, the old American Revolution mantra, uh, 
uh, we had better hang together or most assuredly we will hang separately. Um, uh, any chance of success was going to come out of that unity of effort and everything we did we basically did together. Uh, we had uh, uh, joint strategic assessment teams, joint campaign plans, uh, joint campaign, campaign plan implementation task force, joint working groups, more joint task forces. Um, with General Odierno, uh, members of his staff were members of my staff. Uh, my, my closest, uh, most tightly held morning meetings always had a representative of General Odierno in the office. Um, there simply could not be any daylight between us. And if you can get that going at the four-star level, you can push it down. Uh, not without pain, wailing, gnashing, and sometimes blood bloodshed, but you can do it. Um, so the first part of the answer is you just get her done on the spot. The harder problem, and one that in my view we still have not mastered, is institutionalizing this. Uh, uh, there, there is no manual uh, for whole of government organization and approach. Uh, the State Department came up years ago with uh, an office called the uh, Coordinator for Reconstruction and Stabilization uh, that, that is supposed to coordinate the civilian effort worldwide. It's still a shell. Uh, and what I found I had to do as ambassador was uh, go through the speed dial to various cabinet level secretaries saying, um, Mr. Attorney General, I really badly need 25 assistant U.S. attorneys and I need them a week from Friday, okay? Um, there, there, uh, there isn't a mechanism to compel that whole of government approach. It is left to field commanders, I think military and civilian, uh, and I hope that as we move ahead as a government, we find ways to, uh, to better uh, impose and, uh, and coordinate that. And just to pick up on um, uh, Ray's last point. Um, it isn't just whole of government, it's, it's, um, it's whole of international effort. One of the things we successfully did in Iraq was bring the United Nations uh, into coordinated operations where they worked uh, off of our um, provincial reconstruction team bases. We housed them, we secured them, you moved them, um, they could not have done this on their own and they made a crucial difference as we moved into the election. So it's an, it's an internationalization of the whole of government's effort. Right now that is being carried out more by uh, the force of will of individuals in the field than it is by any um, effective standard operating procedure. If I could just add to that one more piece. When, when uh, we used to have our, and Ryan and I would meet three, four times a week in the mornings or at least talk on the phone or something, but that sounds like it's a minor thing. But you don't understand how much goes on, how much was going on every single day inside of Iraq. And Ryan would be working a significant amount of political issues. I'd be working a significant amount of military security issues. And they overlap. And if it wasn't for us sitting down and talking through and letting each other know what's going on, we would have disconnects. And we'd end up working against each other, potentially. And so it is absolutely key for the senior leaders to sit down. And then when we did the surge, we embedded State Department teams with our brigades. And we found all of a sudden we, we, we gained the synergy that they were working together because they were sharing everything they were doing together. And so it, it sounds sometimes one day when we had a meeting, well, a meeting talking about very serious issues every single day can make a huge difference. And there's no way I, I could have known everything he was doing and he could know everything we were doing every day. And so it was important we sat down and discussed that. The, the other lesson I learned, and I kind of learned this, I was fortunate because I got to spend about 18 months as the military advisor to Secretary Powell and then Secretary Rice. So I got to understand the State Department a little bit. But what you don't realize is the military is overwhelming. I mean, I mean, we go into Iraq and we have 175,000 people. And I have lots of general officers. I got these huge staffs that can do incredible things. And then you have the State Department that has a very small staff. Then we say, okay, we want to do all these things together with you. And of course, we have 40 people for every one of theirs, or 50, or whatever, or 100. I don't know. But we considered it about even. Yeah. Okay. So, 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 so what we had, so what we had to do, 
as Ryan said, is I started embedding people inside of the embassy and they work for the ambassador to build their capacity and use their expertise. And it, it served me better because then we, had, we learned what was going on, we had a better idea how we could support and it brought this synergy together. So it, it does, it's about leadership. And I'm not, you know, this is always about leadership. If the leaders are not willing to do this, it will not happen. If leaders are willing to do it, it will happen. And, and, and especially now, as Ryan said, it's not codified. But we certainly know it must be because we know in Afghanistan they're doing the same thing we did in Iraq. Uh, and even in Pakistan where we have mili some military forces there doing some humanitarian things and others. You know, all around the world, they've got to be very tightly knitted with the ambassador. Uh, if you don't do that, we'll never have unity of effort. Thank you very much. Could I invite you um, now to pose some questions? We have a few minutes before uh, this panel ends, and I, I would be very, very grateful for questions and comments. Please. Hi, Joyce Davis with the uh, World Affairs Council of Harrisburg. Um, I think everyone in this room pretty much is familiar with the Middle East, and we've watched how in many countries um, the people will experiment at least with Islamic government. So the question that I'm asking you is if indeed the U.S. is closing the book, is clearly stepping away to allow the Iraqi people to determine their fate. And considering what we know about the influence of Iran uh, amongst the majority Shias in the country, uh, can you envision, uh, you know, the possibility of an Islamic state emerging after the United States leaves? And what do you see as uh, factors that would contribute or not contribute to that and how do you think the American people will feel having basically created another Islamic State? Good question. Uh, well, my first theorem on the Middle East is it's complicated, and you just asked one incredibly complicated question. <clears throat> uh, uh, there is little likelihood of an Islamic State emerging in Iraq because Iraq's Muslims are... Uh, divided between uh, Sunnis and Shia. Um, uh, they would not be able to agree uh, at all on a, a common theocratic approach to government as uh, happened in, in the case of Iran. Uh, another dimension of this is the relationship between Iran and Iraq. Uh, um, the vast majority of Iranians, uh, of course, are Shia, a substantial uh, majority of Iraqis are Shia, yet those two countries fought a vicious eight-year war um, uh, to defend their histories, their borders, their nationalities, their ethnicities against the other. Uh, uh, the common bond of Shiism did nothing to uh, ameliorate uh, probably the most vicious ground campaign we've seen since the trench warfare of World War I. Uh, but that does not mean Iran is not a problem in Iraq. And I'll, I'll come back to my earlier comment. Uh, the Iranians have had a couple of bad years in Iraq. Um, uh, when I got there in the beginning of 07, they were sponsoring militias that were hugely destructive. Uh, because of the surge that General Odierno had the key role in implementing, uh, we started a virtuous circle uh, uh, where Sunnis turned against Al-Qaeda. Shia noticed that instead of Sunnis fighting Shia, they were fighting a common enemy. They reassessed their ties to Iranian-backed militias. The Iraqi government turned against those militias and defeated them. So a bad couple of years for Iran. But you know what the Iranians are saying now? They're saying, hey, your American friends are going home soon. And guess what? We're still going to be here. We're always going to be here because we've always been here. Uh, and that is why I urge um, that as a government, a Congress, and a people, we turn the page to increasing Iraqi responsibility, to an increasing civilian support role, but we not close the book. Uh, because believe me, there are others out there, not just the Iranians, also Al-Qaeda, uh, the Syrians, who also have a very bitter history with Iraq, who are all set to march through the remaining chapters without us, and it will not be a pretty story. 
If I could just add, I think um, you have to uh, delineate between uh, what Iran wants and what is going on. I mean, I think Iran would obviously wants to have significant influence over Iraq. Uh, they would probably like to see an Islamic State established in Iraq at some time. Uh, you know, there's also a thing we haven't talked about, which Ryan probably knows a little bit more about than I do, but there's also this religious uh, quarrel between Iran and Iraq about Qom and Najaf, who, who, is the, who is the head of Shia Islam. And so, so that plays a role in all that as well. But what Iran wants and what Iraqis want are very different things. Iraqis do not want Iran to come in and have lots of influence inside of Iraq. Uh, that every poll, and, 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 and as I've watched Iraqis vote over the last several years, uh, they want to have Iraqis in charge and they'd like to see it in a democratic process because their participation has been tremendous. So what I worry about is that they lose confidence in the democratic process, especially as we continue to go through this long stalemate of forming a government. And I worry more about that than what that could lead to. N not that I believe Iran's going to have this wave of influence that all of a sudden comes in. I don't think the Iraqis will allow that to happen. Are there factions that will? Yes. But Iraqis as a whole will not allow that to happen. And I want to reemphasize what Ryan just said. That's why it's important. For, I always worry about in December of 2011, just a little over a year from now, when our U.S. forces leave, uh, that uh, we lose interest in Iraq. And, and to me, that's the issue of the future, is we cannot lose interest. And it gets back to the Strategic Framework Agreement, which talks about political, economic uh, relationships, uh, cultural exchanges, educational exchanges, medical exchanges. These all play a key piece for us sustaining a relationship that also allows the Iraqis to continue to build a more stable government which allows them to stand up against countries like Iran and some others who want to come in and try to dominate and have too much influence inside of Iraq. And so in my mind, the next three to five years are the most critical. And it has to do with how we react to that. And there'll be a, there'll be a lot of discussion about how much money we spend on Iraq because they are an oil nation and they should be spending their own money. I don't think anybody disagrees with that. But we know that they will not reap the benefits of their oil probably until 2013 or 14. Because they have to rebuild that infrastructure to get it out of the ground. And so until that time, we have to be there to assist them through political and economic issues. And to me, that's, that's the way for us to stop what you described as happening. Although I would argue, I think that would be... I don't think that will ever happen, but I never say never to anything, so. Uh, to keep to the uh, promise we made to both General Odierno and Ambassador Crocker, you've got a short question and two short answers. What, I, what I'd like to do is to press a little further on this whole issue of capacity building. Many of the current capacity building efforts are pretty much keyed on a timeline till the U.S. military begins to go home, in part because, as I understand it, there is this habit of ensuring that nobody goes out to outside the green zone without a lot of military escort. At some point, that's not going to be possible, and yet the capacity building is going to have to be longer term. So how do we square that? This is not in the level of broad strategy, but in terms of the operational piece of this, of sustaining this capacity when we may not be able to provide the military support that we presently do? The answer that I let Ryan. Um, I think first off, uh, you know, the plan is to maintain... It's a misnomer to think everybody's in the green zone, for one thing. There are people all around the country inside of Iraq. There are going to be two consulates established in Erbil and Basra. There's going to be other outposts, State Department outposts. They keep changing their names, so I'll just call them an outpost for now in other parts of the country. Uh, where they will continue to support uh, capacity building within, within Iraq. Um, they work with military escorts now, but some work with some civilian contractor escorts. Over time, what, we've, what, we, what we advise them to do, and they're now starting to do it, is start to, to let the Iraqis provide you escort. I have enough confidence in the Iraqi military that they will be able to do that with some U.S. oversight to that. And so they have to start moving in that direction, which will allow us then to do this uh, capacity building. 
I, I also, you know, and it's kind of related to this, I'm sorry I'm taking a little longer, but the one thing where I've changed again my view over time as I've seen Iraq progress is I believe there's a time when our, our, our large military presence becomes counterproductive. And I think we're close to that time where it's starting to become counterproductive because as the Iraqis see the Iraqi security forces continue to improve, they don't understand why you need 50,000 U.S. forces on the ground. So that's why the plan is to slowly go down to zero as they increase their capacity. And that's why today we just have trainers and advisors with them. They, the Iraqis have been doing security in Iraq now since the beginning of uh, 2010. So it's been about 10 months now where they've really been in charge of everything. And we've slowly drawn down our force. And they've done pretty well. We have not seen security get worse. We still have violence. We haven't seen it get worse. So we have to continue that, that support. So we've got a couple of minutes left. And if you'd allow me, I'm going to sneak in one last question. I think this is fast. Um, I really like the unity of effort that you talked about, and I just wondered if you could sort of speak to, is that pervasive in top American military command, or are you fairly unique? I think, I, I would just say, I think we've learned this. I mean, I mean um, you know, our last major conflict before Iraq in 2003 was Desert Storm. We were in and out. And so we went in, the military did their job, we left, everything was great, it went, went well. This obviously was much more complex, and we realized that that's the only way you can succeed, and we've realized that now in Afghanistan. And so I think that within the military, we clearly understand this now. But my worry is what Ryan just said, though. It's not codified, and I worry that we'll lose over time what we have learned here, and we'll repeat mistakes of the past. So it's my responsibility and others to ensure that we don't do that. Perspective. Um, uh, in my foreign service career, I have had a long and very productive uh, relationship with my, my military counterparts. Uh, I would just give you a couple of examples. I was ambassador to Kuwait in the mid-1990s uh, when Saddam Hussein looked like he was going to invade again. Uh, uh, a swift response from the administration in 1994 precluded that, but then the commander, Central Command, and I spent the next three years working together to set in place security agreements and a security architecture in Kuwait, air bases, pre-positioning, uh, robust exercises, uh, and so forth, uh, to guarantee that it could never happen again. Uh, uh, civil military cooperation was in Kuwait was the number one item in my portfolio. Uh, in Pakistan in 2005, the, um, uh, the Great Kashmir earthquake that killed 80,000 Pakistanis in two minutes uh, led to the, um, the largest and longest airborne humanitarian relief mission by the United States since the Berlin airlift. Uh, and that was a completely coordinated civil military operation I chaired meetings three times a day, seven days a week for five months um, out of my office, bringing everybody together for a total unity of effort approach. Uh, it can be done. It is being done around the world um, because, again, um, if you're smart enough to get to where the three of us have gotten um, and lucky enough, uh, you, you, you have learned how important that sort of thing is, but it still needs to be codified. If I could just... I got to just fit. Yeah, it's on me. So, so you know, you're off the hook now. So if I, uh, if I just, the good news about this, though, is we have a lot of young officers, both in the State Department and the military, who've experienced this at the lowest levels, and they understand the importance of this. So I think that will bode us, bode well for us in the future. Since, since I didn't get to make an obvious statement, I'm going to make close, but there's somebody I think wants to, if you want. Uh, quickly, uh, with the... Uh, increase in the number of women in the State Department and now in the military, you have the opportunity to get a lot of right brain thinking into that. Will right brain thinking get into Iraq? And when and how? Ray, what do you think? <laughs> well, you know, it, uh, uh, it's a great point. Um, the, 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 the 
sir, I'm serious here. The, the, the Foreign Service State Department has, um, has worked very hard um, uh, to get a Foreign Service that looks like America, particularly in gender balance. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of uh, pleased that uh, uh, three of my last four bosses as Secretary of State have been women. Uh, uh, we have a, an award now um, this is going to sound incredibly boastful, and it is. Um, uh, in, in May of 2009, Secretary Clinton created something called the Ryan Crocker Award for Outstanding Achievement in Expeditionary Diplomacy. That means basically go to really, really awful places, uh, <laughs> and if you come back alive, <laughs> we'll present something to you. Um, uh, it's been given twice. Um, it was given last year to a provincial reconstruction team leader in um, uh, uh, eastern Afghanistan, spent 18 months out there, lost two of her people to IED attacks, spoke fluent Pashto, negotiated agreements between tribes and the military, then between tribes and tribes, and then between tribes and the government in Kabul. Um, she left uh, three teenage kids at home to go do that. Uh, and the, the second uh, award was just presented, I don't know, yesterday or the day before, uh, to, uh, to Ann Patterson, uh, our outgoing ambassador to Pakistan. So uh, for those of you um, uh, uh, who have um, daughters out there who really want to see combat, uh, don't, 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 don't send them to Ray, send them to us. It's a <laughs> <laughs>